Hello, everyone. I'm Chuan De Ding from Tencent Security Chuan Lab, and today I'm going to talk about Windows security mitigations. So, um, in uh, in recent years, um, uh, Microsoft Windows has already released uh, five ma re five major releases, and each one of them, uh, Microsoft has decided to put some new security features in the release. And in 2017. Uh, they, they decided to put many of the security features under uh, Windows Defender brand, and uh, some of the uh, some of the names are Code Integrity Guard, Exploit Guard, Arbitrary Code Guard, and Application Guard. So today we all go through these security features. Uh, Microsoft Edge has become the new default browser on Windows 10. It is also the most targeted browser in recent Pantone competitions. In fact, it has already surpassed its famous predecessor, Internet Explorer. So normally, an attacker compromises a browser by first scanning code execution in a renderer process. That's the process that parses the web page and executes JavaScript code, etc. And then the attacker needs to Exit, uh, to use another vulnerability to escape from the renderer sandbox. This will get the attacker's normal user privilege on the target system. Uh, in order to do some real harm, the attacker can optionally use another uh, bug to uh, escalate to kernel or system privilege, and that will gain the attacker the full compromise of the target system. The first one I'm going to talk about is Code Integrity Guard. So after compromise the process, uh, attacker can uh, after compromise the process use a piece of shell code. Attacker can uh, load a deal into the compromised process, or it can uh, create an evil process to execute a larger amount of code. Because this way, it's easier to write than shell code. So Windows 10 Threshold 2 introduced two mitigation policies to prevent these from happening. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is child process policy. Uh, when the child process policy is enabled for a certain process, it prevents the process from uh, it prevents pro uh, fr process from creating a sub process um, uh, as the child process of this process. So, how does it work? Well, actually. Um, at that time, Windows did not have a uniform way of recording mitigation policies for a certain process. So this, this particular policy is recorded in the token, token flag field of the kernel, uh, token, kernel, token kernel object. So when a process is created, uh, it first needs to derive its token from its parent process. Uh, that is done in the security subsystem, or SE, in the NTOS kernel. And uh, the security subsystem check, checks the token flag field to see if there is a child process restricted bit in that token flag field. And if found, it denies the process creation. And also, the uh, attacker can also choose to load a deal into a compromised process. So the process signature policy uh, is, is checked during, pro, uh, during a section creation. Uh, whenever a deal is loaded into a process, it first needs to create an image section into that process. So before the section is created, uh, the memory subsystem, or MM, uh, calls the calls the code integrity subsystem, or CI, to check if the executable deal backing this, backing this section is, has, uh, has a digital signature or is digitally signed. Uh, if not, it prevents the section from create, created. So there's three levels for process signature policy. The first one is Microsoft sign only. Uh, this is the most restrictive one, as it only allows uh, loading of certain Microsoft core system files. The se second one is store signed only. The store signed only allows loading additional files from Windows Store. All the universal Windows apps has this uh, level of uh, protection enabled, so they cannot load unsigned deals by default. 
And the last one is mitigation opt-in. This not only allow, allow load Microsoft or store files, but also WHQL files, which is normally part of a device driver package. So CIG has some li limitations. Um, attackers can choose to implement their own loader, such as um, a loader that maps the DO file into uh, a block of executable memory. Since it's only an executable memory and not a metric section, it cannot trigger the uh, code integrity policy. So it's a little bit harder, but still trivial to bypass. Next thing I'm going to talk about is Windows Defender Exploit Guard. Um, Windows Defender Exploit Guard uh, is used to protect m memory vulnerabilities. The memory vulnerabilities are the most common way to remotely compromise an application such as a web browser. Uh, we do have DEP or ASLR on uh, modern web operating systems, but this is not enough. A DEP SLR has too many bypasses. Um, so we do need, what we do need a, is a built-in protection as, at the system level. The EMET, or Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit uh, by Microsoft, is quite powerful, but it's not pre-installed. The Exploit Guard is basically a system-level re-implemented EMET. It is internally called Payload Restrictions. Uh, because it restricts attacker's ability to deliver a malicious payload after uh, attacker gains uh, control over the execution flow. So uh, exploit guard can um, be enabled both dynamically or statically. For dynamic enablement, the source process, uh, the process that starts the, uh, starts the exploit guard process, uh, pass a payload restriction policy structure to the uh, NTOS kernel. For the static enablement, there's uh, uh, image file execution options. Uh, actually, Microsoft has introduced a new feature for IFEO called IFEO filter. Uh, traditionally, IFEO can only set options by the image base name. Now, uh, by using IFEO filter, uh, we can specify a four pass for the for the uh, executable to be to be filtered to be enabled as uh, certain mitigation policies so exploit guard is enabled via uh, via our undocumented feature undocumented feature called uh, verify a hook the verify hook starts at the earliest time possible in NTDO. Uh, NTDO calls the verify hook and loads the payload restrictions deal from the system32 directory. Uh, although the exploit guard is completely implemented in the user mode, there are also kernel facilities to help uh, implement the exploit guard. This, uh, this structure is an uh, unsigned loan 32-bit. Uh, it records all the features that exploit guard has, and NTDO before the process initialization, we'll read, this, read the information from this structure and pass it on to the payload restrictions deal. So the exploit guard also registers for deal notification. This is another undocumented feature in NTDO. Uh, after this uh, notification is registered, uh, whenever a deal loaded into or unloaded from the process, the NTDO first calls the uh, notification callback. So by, uh, by registering this notification, um, Exploit Guard can patch the newly loaded deal uh, into, into the process. Exploit Guard, uh, like EMET, also use a uh, user mode hook to implement its features. Uh, in, this, in, in all these hooks, it checks for potentially illegal operations. But Exploit Guard also comes with its own limitations, just like EMET. Uh, its user mode hook can be bypassed, of course, and it definitely increased the difficulty of code execution, but it's really not preventing it because already, already the attacker already get, the con uh, get control over the execution flow. 
Next thing I'm going to talk about is called arbitrary code guard. Arbitrary code guard is introduced in Windows 10 Redstone 2. Uh, today, most exploits need to either allocate or modify ex uh, executable memory. By, uh, by limiting that behavior, exploit uh, uh, arbitrary code guard actually breaks most of exploits available uh, in the wild. So uh, uh, arbitrary code guard limits uh, three kinds of behavior. First is creating executable memory. And second is modifying executable memory. And third is uh, cr uh, mapping a writable or end executable section. So there are four policies for dynamic code policy. This is called prohibited dynamic code, allow thread opt out, allow remote downgrade, and uh, audit prohibited dynamic code. The first one turns on the arbitrary code guard, and the second one allows uh, dynamic disable of the arbitrary code guard on a per thread basis. And the third one allows uh, disable of arbitrary code guard from another process. And the fourth one is enabling the arbitrary code guard in a log only mode. This is quite useful when you are developing an application that uses the arbitrary code guard. So this, uh, this policy is actually checked in three, uh, in three, uh, three different API calls. Uh, the first one is mapping a view of section. This is mapping an executable section. Second is allocating a executable memory. And third is changing the protection of the existing memory blocks. Uh, all these are going to MI arbitrary code block function. And this function actually checks for the per process ACG switch and also the per uh, pro thread uh, ACG disable switch. If, uh, if the process is opt into the ACG and the thread is not opt out of the ACG, well, this action is blocked by the ACG. So for, by enabling the ACG, the most, uh, no, most, most important problem is how do we deal with the legitimate applications that actually use dynamic code generation? Uh, the most obvious example being the web browsers. Web browser has JavaScript engines. JavaScript engine nowadays always use just-in-time compiler to generate native code for JavaScript. And this will need to allocate executable memory in the render process. And this will, of course, be, this, uh, this will of course be uh, blocked by the ACG. So to solve that problem, the Microsoft Edge has chosen to re-architect its JavaScript engine to move the JIT part out of the process. So it turns out the ACG only checks the source process, not the target, which means that if you are ACG process, you cannot allocate executable memory in the normal process. But if you are a normal process, you can allocate uh, executable memory in ACG process. So by sending the JavaScript code to a JIT server and the JIT server compiles the JavaScript code and send back through, uh, send back through writing and executable memory in the render process. This way, uh, we implemented an out-of-process JIT compilation. So ACG has its own set of limitations. First, it increased design complexity dramatically because it requires out-of-process compilation for any dynamic code. Also, attackers can also generate limited native code via out-of-process JIT because, uh, uh, because the, the JIT server cannot distinguish between legitimate or illegal requests for the JIT code compilation. Also, not all, also not all GPU drivers are compatible with ACG. Um, uh, Windows 10 use a blacklist to, to detect any incompatibility, and if detected, it uses an um, allow thread opt out switch to disable the ACG. Also, ACG does not protect against return oriented programming or ROP. 
So ROP does not generate any new code or, or modifying any existing code. So it does not trigger any ACG policies. And yet another layer of protection is, is introduced in Windows 10 RS3. It's called Windows Defender Application Guard. So the application guard is basically a virtual machine running on the local computer, running only, only Microsoft Edge in, inside the virtual machine, so powered by the Hyper-V virtualization technology. It is not enabled by default and can be enabled via group policy. So when a user opens the web page in application guard, it automatically renders the web page in a virtual machine. So like, like any other virtual machines, uh, application guard shares the same hardware with the host operating system. But it does have its own operating system kernel, uh, services, and applications. So by enabling APCG, we see several processes popped up on the host operating system. Uh, there's Hyper-V service, VM compute, and also the uh, Hyper-V manager process. So the Hyper-V service actually creates a unique identifier for the new container. And the VM compute process uh, actually starts the container for, a, for, the, for the application guard. And finally, after the container is started, uh, uh, after the container is started, it uses remote desktop protocol to connect to the local computer. So there's the RDP client running on local computer. It's actually a local desktop protocol, if you will. So this this RDP client relays all the UI, clipboard, and printer through the RDP protocol. And this is sandboxed by default with all the mitigation enabled. And also, um, this is a simplified overview of the application guard. And on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side is the, is the host OS. And on the right-hand side, the child partition is the guest OS. These two operating systems can only communicate via VM bus. It's a communication mechanism implemented via shared memory. So there's a set of VSCs, or virtual service clients, that relays all the uh, device requests, file operations, to the VSPs on the host operating system. Also, there's a DNS client that actively detects if it's running in application guard. If so, it redirects its uh, DNS request to the host uh, WDAG proxy. So there's a virtual hard disk for the, for the, for, for the virtual machine. The first one, the system template base, it's a virtual disk for the container OS image. This is generated from the system files of the host OS. Um, and the, for the file writes operations in the virtual machine, it uses another virtual disk called Sandbox Virtual Disk. This captures all the write operations, and it, it is discarded after each run of the virtual machine. The storage virtual service provider handles all the container storage access. So you see the sandbox virtual disk is mounted on C. And there's another persistent disk, another two persistent disks uh, for storing logs and user files. So when you're trying to run anything apart from Microsoft Edge in the container, it gives you this message. It says, this app cannot be run in Windows Defender Application Guard. Please contact your administrator for help. Well, I am the administrator, right? So how can I get around this? Actually, uh, it use another guard called device guard to implement this to, to restrict certain applications from running in the container. This device guard is, uses an undocumented binary format for its, uh, for its rules. 
This is converted from the XML format and comes preloaded with the virtual machine. After a bit of reverse engineering, we were able to recover its file format, and it has a fixed length header, and also uh, multiple blocks of variable length data. It has many information stored, uh, the signers, signing scenarios, and EKUs and secure boot settings. But the most important part is the file rules. The file rules uh, allows the allows the device guard to deny certain applications from running by checking its file name, or version information, or signatures. So how do we run our own tools in the application guard? Well, remember we say it's a binary file. It turns out if you remove the file physically from the container image, and the device guard policy will be disabled. So the most, most simple way to do this is to get the open source vimlib tool. It's an editor for the Windows imaging format. So use the, use the vim delete command to remove the policy file from the Windows Defender application guard uh, image and restart the application guard. Then use a common dialog to open the explore, explorer window in the application guard. Then you can run anything inside it. So what's actually inside the virtual machine? Well, actually, it's a pure Windows 10 professional edition. It has certain virtual machine agents running inside for process operations. Um, this virtual machine has a random password set by the Hyper-V service. It is used for remote desktop connections. Um, uh, things like clipboard printers uh, is not enabled by default, but can be configured via group policy. So there are two virtual machine agents running inside. The first one is called Hyper-V Guest Compute Service. This, uh, this service is, uh, is the service to communicate with the host via the Hyper-V socket. It controls the comp container state and modify container settings. And also, it redirects uh, the standard output and input for, uh, uh, from, for any application to the Hyper-V socket. The second is called Container Execution Agent, or EXEC service. It's a RPC server uh, running inside the virtual machine for creating users and shutdown systems. But actually, there's no process for Microsoft Edge controller. Actually, there's no need for controlling Microsoft Edge. The user is directly controlling it from outside the virtual machine through the remote desktop protocol. So in conclusion, Windows is more secure with many more newly added mitigations. But these mitigations are not silver bullets. Attackers can always find ways around them. Virtualization as an additional layer of protection can significantly increase the difficulty of exploitation, but at the cost of performance. Actually, the runtime performance penalty is too high for everyday use. Uh, that will be all for today. Thank you.